from my left to the extreme left. Um, with me here is Beatrice Lamwaka, a uh, Ugandan writer, um, who has recently been shortlisted uh, for the Miles Morland Writing Scholarship in 2016. Beatrice Lamwaka is a, is a recipient of the 2011 Young Achievers Award. She was shortlisted for the 2011 Kane Prize for African Writing and was a finalist for the South African Penn Stadzinski Literary Award in 2009. Um, the anthology of short stories, Queer Africa, New and Collected Fiction, published in 2013, which includes her short story, won the 26th Lambda Literary Award in the Fiction Anthology category in 2014. She was selected as one of the young scholars of the, for the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation special program in 2009, and her stories have been translated into Spanish, Italian, French, and she also writes for children. She's got a novella for children called Anina's Victory, uh, which is a supplementary reader in primary schools. Uh, Beatrice is also the general, se general secretary of a Penn Uganda chapter. She's also um, been an executive member of the Ugandan Rep Reproduction Rights Organization, and she has served at, at FemRight previously. Um, and she currently is the director of the Arts Therapy Foundation, um, uh, which works with a <coughs> creative, creative work to, um, um, to, to do therapy. Um, so this is Beatrice Lamarca, can you please give her a hand? <laughs> Next to Beatrice is Praise Nabimanya, who is the author of uh, a short story called Free Fall, which was published in an anthology of short stories called Sundown. Um, Praise is a, um, an independent writer. She says she loves writing. Um, it's her passion, she lives to write. Um, please just give a hand for Praise. <laughs> On Praise's left is Achani Makilet, who's also a contributor to the anthology of short stories called Sundown, and the, the title Story Sundown is actually her story. Um, Achan is studying medicine and surgery. Um, is it at Makere? At Makere University, and she's, um, she loves writing. Please just give a hand to her. So I'd like to thank uh, the three of you for coming today, and I'd like for each of you to just reflect on on what you've been doing recently. I know Beatrice has some things to say about some of the work that she's been doing uh, in the foundation and, and in schools. Uh, so I'd like you to just speak in general about uh, what you're doing currently um, that you'd like to share with us. Okay, um, currently I've just had a baby, so <laughs> which has kept me a bit busy. Uh, I, as, a, as a pen project, we have been uh, doing workshops, creative writing workshops in prison, uh, Luzira, the women's and the men's prison. And um, we have actually come with uh, very good writing from the prison, uh, from different people, uh, especially the men. They are really so interested and passionate about writing and they've written so many short stories and, um, and and poetry because we are going to publish them and they find it as a way of you know connecting with the world through their writing and some of them had never really written anything and but you know the writing is really interesting also uh, as part of them we have been um, doing creative writing workshops in in schools um, unfortunately the schools are not here and five five schools about uh, the students' rights and issues of human rights, and we ho also hope to, to publish them. Um, and we've been sensitizing people about issues of uh, criminal defamation in Uganda. We know that we have so many laws in place that do affect writers in one way or the other, you know, as you write in us think about them and we are thinking, do we need some of the laws that are in place, maybe if we could do away with them so that the writer's wings are not, you know, tied. Yeah, and uh, as uh, art therapy, it's me who founded it. And I, I've, I found out that, you know, writing is therapeutic for me. And so I thought, ooh, there are so many people who also need to do 
um, maybe writing or any form of art to help them. And so, and it, so some people are making beads or telling their stories uh, in order to help them cope. Yeah, basically for now, but thank you. Um, Grace, that's my, that's my name. Um, I'm, I'm just now currently out of school, just doing a diploma course. Um, for the moment, um, I've taken up blogging. I write at um, the Magic in Ordinary Days. Basically, I just um, I just write about how how you just find happiness in the basic in basic life. It doesn't have to be extraordinary for you to be happy. So that's why I'm sharing my poetry and my short stories and um, and my thoughts basically. Yeah, I haven't been into I haven't had anything published since free fall, but I'm working on a few short stories. Um I'm currently in medical school for care and um, it's really it's a very tough time, a really tight time. So I'm afraid I'm putting most of my focus on school over writing, but I'm um, working on that in my collection. Thank you. Um, the, the one question I'd like to ask the three of you to reflect on, if you can, is um, why the short story? The short story seems to really be dominant as a genre um, in Ugandan writing, in, in contemporary African writing, in fact. Uh, and I'd like you to reflect on what the short story does for you. Why the short story? Um, why, why is that form important for you? For me, when I started writing, I, of course, uh, I found like uh, poetry was the easy way for me, like most people. Most people think it's easy to write poetry and then you realize that, oh, it's not actually um, very easy. So even when you read my poetry, it's more like a short story. I think <laughs> I was meant to write short stories even though I tried poetry. Um, and I think that uh, I could say that I. I think I've mastered the art of writing a short story and um, it seemed like the easy way out for me to write whatever I want to write. I'm, I'm, try, I'm writing a novel but still, yeah, I always, you know, it's so easy for me to see things around me and think about a short story that I will write about um, rather than a poem or a, a novel, <laughs> for instance. So, Thank you. Um, for me, I, I think uh, sh writing shorter, shorter writings are easier for me because mostly writing is therapy to me. So mm. when I have when I have a problem, maybe I'm going through something, writing something short, it's like the moment I start writing after completing the writing, it's like I've been talking to a counselor. So. So writing longer things is um, it's like I would be prolonging what I'm going through. So writing shorter things is a bit easier for me. Okay. And also, I think the short story also enables us to tell so many stories in in a short time frame. You know, like there are so many stories we want to get there. I feel like the literary um, community in Uganda is quite shall I say young compared to. Um, the literary communities in other places. I feel like it's only now just beginning to bloom as it should. And so we have so many stories that are buried within us and we need to get them out as quickly as possible. That's very wonderful. So I get the sense that uh, for Beatrice, short stories allow you to self reflect. Um, and now you're using that form to work with, uh, with prisons and with children and for therapy. Um, and you obviously have had a longer time to develop your craft. With a short story, as you say, you know, it's a form that over time really seems to work for you. Uh, and praise, you say that there's something about self-reflection, also about therapy. Um, and um, Achan, you're talking about the politics around the production of stories in, in, um, in Uganda and East Africa and resources. Really interesting things about all these stories that, that need to be told. And the long form of the novel doesn't quite um, 
doesn't quite allow for the urgency of these stories to come out, which is, which is quite, quite interesting. Uh, I don't know if you, each of you could reflect on, on, on this thing about trauma and why, why therapy, why, why at this point writing seems to really focus on therapy. Um, I'm just interested in that, in that dynamic. Uh, for me, I come from, uh, from Gulu and uh, we experience about 20 years of war and, I, and it had a great impact. And for me, writing uh, seemed to, I, I don't know, if you read my stories, I shared a lot of like, my pain or my tears or what I'm going through, uh, through my writing. Uh, in the beginning when I started writing, I didn't think about it that way. It's much later than I realized that, oh, okay, yeah, this is what I'm actually doing. And uh, uh, I always love stories, and so I, I think it just turned out to be, you know, writing and you know, trauma, dealing with trauma and painful experiences. And short stories seem to serve that purpose. Um, I, I think for me, it's really, it's really more of a personal nature. Okay, um, I think um, it's more to do with the way I grew up, really, and the fact that I'm um, a very introverted person. So most of the time, I live in my head. So um, because most people get therapy through talking. So me, I find it easier to just let my thoughts out. So that's the way I feel. It's really more of a personal nature. Um, to add to what Teresa is saying, I think this realization that there are people out there listening has forced them to write in the comments. Like, for example, in social media. Um, for me, I look at my writing boards into my Facebook posts. And it started out as a Fascinating. I, I have a, 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 a comment to make about um, younger writers because it's clear that Beatrice has, has had a longer, she's produced, she's got a bigger corpus of work, she's worked with the short story and worked with various literary communities. Um, I find that um, these days in the 21st century, younger writers, uh, there's so much pressure to produce something. Um, and I get your point about short stories being a, a form that, uh, that can quickly get out the stories out there with little resources, um, but be able to do the work of telling the stories. But I find that younger writers have a lot of pressure to produce something. 50 years ago, or someone like Buchi Amicheta from Nigeria, or young older writers, they had time to develop their voice and their craft and the, you know. Um, and I'd like you to reflect on that. Do you, do you feel the pressure now that you've got a short story that's uh, in an anthology and one that has a title of the anthology, do you feel the pressure to, to produce? Do you feel, I'd like you to reflect on it and maybe Beatrice can also reflect on our own journey in relation to that. Well, yes, I do. I think um, part, of the, part of the situation is the fact that right now there are more of us. And you, you feel like once you're in a place where you have people's attention, you don't want to lose it. So you have to keep their attention. And for a writer, the only way to do that is to keep writing. I suppose you guys are quite young, you've come into the scene. Um, yeah, it is. Um, I, I just thought about um, uh, my first short story was published in 2001 uh, in a collection, uh, an anthology published by Femright. And so, um, um, a professor, a writer, walked to me and said, uh -huh, now that you've had your short story published, do not stop there. Don't just be like a one short story person. Because we ha I, I'm, I'm sure like, you know, there are so many people who wrote one short stories and you can never find them. Um, so 
And also, I think for me, also being part of FEM, right, because then you have this community of people who are supporting you, who are telling you about opportunities, who are encouraging you to write. Uh, and so you start to send out your work and, you know, getting a rejection, or, and you still celebrate your rejection. Um, then you send again and uh, you get an acceptance and you celebrate that um, and you encourage each other. I think also has helped that, you know, like we just continue to write and dream big. Fantastic. Now, um, I'd, I'd like you guys to reflect also a little bit on, uh, on literary prizes because um, my previous question was kind of leading to this thing about literary prizes because you find there's a lot of prizes now that focus on the short story. And I wonder whether that, that is the motivation for, part of the motivation for the short story as a genre to be flourishing now. Uh, and whether people are actually writing, and whether those prizes mean anything to you, whether, you, whether they, 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 they influence your motivation to write, uh, to be out there. Prizes really make, pe pe put people out there. I mean, if you win the Kane Prize, there are all these other things that come with it, the Common Short Story Prize. Yeah. So if you could just reflect, reflect on that as well. Perhaps we can start from that um, side. Well, uh, I think that, yes, the surprise of being focused a lot on short stories is motivation for more people writing short stories. But then I think that the abundance of prizes can get a little problematic in that people start to learn what kind of story the prizes expect. What kind of story usually they and you get prizes influencing what kind of stories are being written instead of the stories speaking for themselves mm -hmm. and winning. Not that it's the same way for all prizes, mm -hmm. but of course, if you're writing a story um, while thinking about a prize, then it's going to be altered in a certain way. Personally, when I wrote that down, before writing them, started accepting stories for the prize. When I wrote that down, I had not yet had For me, um, first of all, I'm just happy that there are so many prizes that, you know, like uh, uh, sort of like a platform for writers to be known or for me, like when I got shortlisted for the Kane Prize, you know, you, or newspapers across the world cover it and so that, you know, you get known and then you, of, of course, have a free trip to London, why not, I, you know? <laughs> so. <laughs> There are benefits. Uh, I'm sure if you won the Kane Prize now, it's more, it's better now. With so, it comes with so many, many benefits. And we all need money. So if you won and you got money, why not? Um, I know there, there's a lot of criticism about many prizes of having maybe themes or ooh, these are the kind of stories they look for or is it poor, poverty porn or something like that. But always I think that it's always up to the judges. And for me like the year that I got shortlisted for the for the Kane Prize, that's it's it's there's some these when you get shortlisted that means your story is good enough to win. But then 
then they will the judges will go deep into your style how does she use language how you know there's some things that if you think it's what the story is about it's never about that it's always now about style about what's beautiful about this not because oh this one has written about maybe poverty then we will give it to her because the judges also have credibility. They're not just going to be like, let's give that one. They want to stand and say, I chose this story because of this and that and that and that. And also that, that helps us to improve our writing because if you submit and it's, it's quara quara, no one is going to, <laughs> no one is going to look at it twice. So you really have to cut someone's attention. How are you going to, how are they going to select your story from 8,000, you know, submission? Is it because you've written about poverty? No. It's because you've written something that is beautiful, whether it's about poverty or it's about whatever it is. So there is something that, you know, there is, the writer has got some beauty in the writing. And so, uh, as there are many prizes, that means you have to improve your writing as well to get wherever you get. I think now we have lots of spaces to share our work. Like when I started, FemRite was the space, and now we have Write Division. You have many opportunities. And uh, also, not just with Ugandan writers, we are networking with so many writers from different countries. And, and um, through our connections, our work is, you know, you know we, we, we are getting there in every place that you can get. I think that the spaces is just helping the writers. And, and I'm happy that, you know, like people are excited. We have audience always. Um, people are writing, different people, even in schools, people are writing. And so, we are taking writing seriously. Uh, there are a number of people when you tell them, oh, I write, and they will just quickly ask you for which newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> so then you say, no, I write a book. Book? Yeah, and then maybe you show them. So we also have that. And one by one, we bring them on, and we have a bigger market. Than Thank you. I think you. You've preempted the question I wanted to ask, Praise and, uh, and, and Immaculate Ashan, um, about audiences or about, do you, do, when you started writing as younger writers in Uganda at the moment, all these exciting things that are happening, did you have an audience? Or were you, I know that you've kind of said, you've spoken about writing for yourself and for therapy. So when the story went out into the anthology, did you start thinking about the kind of people who are going to read the story? Or did you think, in fact, that unconsciously as you're writing the story, that in fact you had an audience of people out there. So I'd like the both of you to reflect on that. Um, basically, um, the, the stories I've written before, even from high school, mm. have always been read by friends, just friends. So free for being out there means uh, the audience is bigger, which is a bit scary because now the, the, the criticism is, going, is a bit... Um, <laughs> Because uh, I as many uh, a few friends who a few editor friends have read the story and they had a lot to say about it. It's not as good as I actually thought it was before when I was when I was writing it for myself. So that's that the audience that that the thought that the audience is actually bigger and maybe more um, more professional kind of uh, puts the pressure of now. Now I have to really look at my typos, look at... So it helps me improve the, the fact that the audience is now bigger. But before it just used to be friends and they would be all for, oh, this is so nice, why don't you write a novel? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love my phrase. Before I started writing when I was really young, it was probably 99% of it was rubbish. I was writing when I was in P5, I was in
So just before we, um, we give you a chance to read from your work, I have two very weird questions I'd like to ask each of you. The one is, what are you reading right now? And the second one is, what, do you, what did you do immediately you finished that first short story? The moment you finished it, you said it's finished. What is the, once you finished writing it, what's the thing you did afterwards? Like, when you're sitting on your desk and, and you put that full stop at the end of that short story, what did you do after that? How do you feel? You know. And for you, Beatrice, specifically, I'd like you to, um, I'd like you to, what would you tell them, the, the younger ones who are coming up excited and, you know, how, what would you advise them about, about writing? So okay. I'd like each of you to just to, answer those questions. To answer all the questions, or for, I just answer one. Well, well, you can choose whichever you'd like to answer, but yeah. Okay, for me, uh, like when I finished writing, I, always feel like a big weight has been taken off me like i feel, I feel so relieved and um, and then uh, i'm relieved and probably i i i like to celebrate like every little thing i celebrate even if i take a cup of tea or something but i'm in a you know celebratory mood so i'm like i finished this big thing okay let me take my cup of tea or something like that mm. so i normally do that and then i have a writing club where i know that before my writing goes anywhere i will share with them mm. so that you know like they can tell me whether i've written something or if it's good enough or yeah i would i always like to hear their opinion on the story and if it's good, then I can send, because sometimes you're never sure whether what you've written makes sense. Mm. Um, then for, for I, I always tell people just read, and then reading will uh, give you all the magic in the world you need, whether to write a story, whether to uh, write a review, or do something, but just read. Read as much as you can. What are you reading right now? Um, I, the book title is called The Power. I don't remember the name of the writer. So the gift. Thank you. So um, moving on to the, to the next section, I'll, so I'd like each of you to read a section of your work. Uh, we'll start with Beatrice and then Praise and then uh, Acham. Um, and then we'll open it up to the audience to ask questions and reflect on what speakers have been. Okay, I'll read my short story called Silverfish. It's here, but I like it on a bigger space. Um, so that's why I have, I have it printed. I normally read while standing. So. <laughs> I wrote a story about a lesbian couple and dedicated it to Bahati. 
She dreamt about how he would launch her book in his bid to gain popularity, and he would only find out in the Daily Monitor that the novel was really about. She would surely send her to prison or make her pay for humiliating him. The thought excited her. She wrote a story about the president's nepotism and obsession with the presidency, but she knew that nobody would read her story anyway. If she got lucky, she'd be published in an obscure journal in, in the US where she'd only get one supplementary copy that she would never lend anybody. Maybe she would photocopy and distribute in the streets of Kampala. This thought also excited her. Every time she told somebody she was a writer, the question was, for which newspaper? Writing, she said. Writing stories for publishers. She knew this was the wrong answer, but she didn't, she did, it didn't matter anyway. At least she had an answer, and it included some mystery. And who reads those stories? She didn't know, and she wished she knew. People, people will read them. She hoped at last somebody, at least somebody, would read her stories besides her father. Which people, they asked. Some people, she said silently. But what do you do? The question kept coming again and again. People always wanted to know what she really did for a living. Writing wasn't work. She must have some sort of job, accounting, teaching. Maybe she should teach again, she told herself, so she could have a job. The ideas of selling designer second-hand clothes, but the thought of missing a price because she didn't sell, I mean, um, selling, sorry, the ideas for selling second-hand designer uh, second-hand clothes, but the thought of missing a price because she didn't, Anyway, that, like everyone else, Aya hopes to build a house in Kololo, drive a Range Rover, and be able to eat in Serena Hotel without worrying about the bill. She knew that she will not be able to achieve any of that soon. She will continue to write if only people could read her writing after she was long dead. She hung on her wall pictures of famous writers. Ben Oakley, Nadine Godman, Ngugi, Chimamanda, Acheva. And when hard times hit her, she stared at the pictures from the residences she attended, Iowa, Bellagio, Magdor. It made her dream of the nice time while she was traveling. She knew that she would be a great writer if she wrote stories that, some, that anybody in school would read. She wanted to be part of the school curriculum replacing Shakespeare. After all, he was long dead and he wouldn't mind. <laughs> Few of her contemporaries never saw her as a threat. Maybe she was. Because she wrote war stories and people liked sad stories, they said. There is no talent there. She is better off getting a government job, said. Nobody wants to read the kind of sto stories she writes. They say behind her back. Others say, it. "These are stories who keep. These are writers who keep writing what the West wants. All the sad stories you would think she never smiles. I want to read her stories when she writes about love in Kampala. No wonder she doesn't want. She doesn't want to live in the city anymore. She moved in a cheap house deep in the village where she bought three taxis." and a border border to get to the city. She wanted to get away from receiving unwanted visitors who always stopped at home. I saw the window open and I wanted to just say hello, they said, and they would stay on for hours. They never bothered to leave, to leave, and she told them, when she told them that she had work to do. Her work was never really work to them. She would make tea and sometimes cook lunch as they looked through her books shelf. Some would never return the books they borrowed. Others asked her for copies of anthologies where her stories were published. Others asked where she got copies of the books. When she said she bought them, they simply smiled out of cuts. Who buys books, they asked themselves. I bring back, but she knew they wouldn't. 
she would either have to threaten them to get them back or pick them herself. Sometimes they were happy to let her know. They lent the book to actual people who read books. He's reading. Don't you like that he's reading it? It's better than the books just being on your bookshelf. They imagine that she placed the books on the bookshelves for decoration or to show off. Aya hoped that nobody would visit her. She hoped that there would, she would be depressed and then forced to work on her novel. That, would, that only worked for a while till her older sister and her nephew moved in with her. She wouldn't write even a word of fiction. Every night she stared at her laptop and heard her sister <coughs> snoring in the next room. She had her nephew's footsteps looking for leftovers. The stories will come. She always told herself that the stories never came. Yeah, I'll stop here. <laughs> Actually, uh, that's, um, I was just writing about, you know, being a writer in Uganda, the experiences. <laughs> now over to Prince, who's going to read from Free Fall. Um, for those uh, who are familiar with um, Chichiga folklore, uh, you may remember many stories about women who are cast, they can get married, so the story is in that context. Um, it was two nights to the wedding when Musa sneaked into my heart, the one where I was being crept into the perfect wife. It was almost midnight, the time when the, ti when the night is darkest, quietest, and the trees make shadows of devilish shapes, worrying our poor wind. The women had all left. I was in that place between slumber and wakefulness when I heard a familiar tap tap on the hearts wooden door. Musa, it's late, I whispered, opening the door. I had to come, my beloved. We get married soon after all, but the women will return any time. Please open up. I'll be gone by the time they wake up. So come on. I'll be first, he said, beseechingly. Stamped by an intense seriousness in his eyes. Even as I reasoned with him, I knew his pleading would eventually wear me down, wear down my insistent refusal as always. I slowly and quietly opened the door and let him in. He immediately reached for me and proceeded to crawl at the blue lace that was wrapped around my body. Seeing him fidgeting with it, I quickly untied the knot that held together that held the lesson together on, her, on my right shoulder. There we gave way to a baser ones, taking care to mute down the sounds and groans that could easily echo in the eerie silence of the night. My eyes opened weary toward daybreak. I looked around as I remembered the events of the previous night. Musa, I cried out, it's time to go. He didn't reply. Musa, Musa, wake up, I repeated, silence. He must be dead asleep, I thought. I moved my hands around to rouse him from sleep as my eyes got used to the early morning light. I felt around only to touch something cold against my wrist. My first thoughts were that it was a snake. I screamed and jumped off the bed naked, all the while shouting for him, wondering why he was not answering. If maybe he had already left. Immense panic gripped me as I rushed and threw open a small window made of wood the small uh, window made of wood to let, in a mo to let in more light. I turned around looking for the hardened piece of wood I usually kept around in case of snakes. Turning towards the bed, I found myself staring into Musa's lifeless white open eyes. Stop here. <laughs> <laughs> skinny up little boy, 15 years old, pulls a t-shirt over his head as he walks out of a and wheels out at the red sky. He's the only human alive who's happy to see the sun on her glorious deathbed. It's a relief to not have to wear a hat, sunglasses, and long sleeve shirts anymore. The scientists, no one trusts, say that the sun has a cure to the world. They even. The boy's cup sneakers kick up snow as he makes his way down the stairs from the porch and he smiles again. Ten years ago, before the gold of the sun bled out, Living in its state of pale red, it would have been a blistering hot day, and any suggestion of the possibility of snow in these parts would have been laughed out of the door and blamed on the many American shows that are taken over African cable television. Now, Uganda is experiencing its first winter. 
Quickly, as, as older, younger women in contemporary Ugandan literature, contemporary writing scene, what could you say? I don't know, just. Could I start with you before? <laughs> I know, Beatrice, you're looking at me suspiciously, like. <laughs> but just, you know, I'd like some reflection on that. You don't have to answer though. So most of the stories I write are built on that on that experience and on those experiences. So basically, that's it. Okay. Um, one time, okay. Um, when I was in London for the Kane Price um, activities, so while there. Suddenly, as you know, like somebody comes from the audience and gives me a gift. And uh, in another scene, someone else gives me something else. So I began to wonder, do I look needy or something? <laughs> but then I found out, someone said, oh, you, you write very difficult topics and we relate with you. And that's why, so yeah, it like made me feel 
better uh, about myself and my writing. Um, I've written uh, a bit about motherhood and I really never, I hadn't experienced uh, that. And, and now that I'm a mother, I'm wondering if the things I wrote, like if I would write them now, because um, since uh, when I got pregnant, I sort of just froze with writing. I've not written anything, and uh, yeah. But I think like my writing will probably change, especially on issues of motherhood or relationship between mother and children. I think so. And of course, when I had my child, before I did, I was free, like, you know, I'm at every event, right um, in and out of Uganda, and just having, um, you know, a good time in writing. And of course, when I had my child, people were like, finally, they, you know, like, we have waited for too long, you know, you know, as a woman, when you reach a certain age, people expect you to start reproduction and, <laughs> and it took me quite a bit so yeah as writers i think in uganda we're very careful there are certain topics that we know that people are don't cross when you do you know um like you know if you write about the first family they'll Stella Nyanzi, <laughs> because you know she I started attacking and saying things and um, and so I feel that we really censor ourselves and we because we don't want uh, I think the journalists are more daring and they have covered uh, topics that corruption and uh, and you know there's so we are sued for criminal defamation uh, and many other things. But I think we have lots of laws in place that if someone wanted to use against anybody for writing something, they definitely can. And I think the writers are also very aware of that. And <laughs> so they try to stay safe. And I don't know if staying safe is helping us because a lot of things are left and said. Uh, your short story, Sandra, is being into the fiction writer. I wonder, as a young writer, if they feel kind of boxed to write or misbehave into fiction. Because I mean, that would be the expectation from the readers that you, that's the kind of genre that you will write into. If you, is, I mean, feeling pressured or conflicted about it, or it's not something that you've thought about, or just how are you navigating probably our expectation of or innocent in the that you might Well, yes, I have thought about it a lot. And, um, you know, at first it was, it wasn't exactly a problem for me because I've grown up writing a lot of categorized as speculative fiction. And yes, sometimes I do feel like, um, but then, but then I realized that there are so many stories that I can tell within the genre of speculative fiction, and um, the feeling of being boxed in like a personal choice on my part. And I do write non-speculative fiction on occasion, and um, I put it out there, and I know it probably won't be given the same reception as a speculative fiction piece because because that's how I have been categorized, but it's a risk I'm willing to take. So um, I, don't, I don't think writers should be put in genre. It's a strange thing to me. I don't understand it. I feel like a writer should write, and whatever they write, well, <coughs> it's fine. Uh, I, I just liked to see you know, a different interpretation of the story, the way, <laughs> <laughs> like, it was quite different. Also, that same story was uh, illustrated, and of course, like the picture of, you know, the lady and her smoking, and not really what I thought about, 
part. <laughs> it's always nice to see how people interpret the story and yeah, so it was quite different for me, but you know, I accepted it because I realized long ago that once you finish with a story and you write and it goes out, you no longer have control of it. It's now for the readers and for everybody to make sense out of it. So I don't really hold on and say, no, it must be like this. No, I don't do that. Yeah. I, my baby's crying. <laughs> And I'm here, and I'm sure that a man does not have to deal with that. So, um, yeah. <laughs> 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 so they can bring to be with. Yeah. So I have a young baby. So every time I'm going somewhere, mm, we go. You know. <laughs> so and he has to deal with that environment. But there. Are, for me, femrights played a big role, like bringing in, you're interested in writing? Come on, uh, we shall train you. Then you meet, uh, you, you have friends, and your best friends become writers, and you're submitting your stories together, you're looking at your stories together and improving it. I think that has played a big role uh, in a number of women. Also, you know, like a woman knowing that, hey, if the other one can do it, I can do it also. Uh, despite the many challenges that we face. So, yeah, I think there's the sisterhood in writing which has helped. I don't know if the men also have the brotherhood and they, you know, hold hands and read the story and, and help each other. I think that if, you, if the men start doing that, I, I know they have threatened with uh, men right for a long time, but we haven't seen that. Um, yeah, as women, we have challenges. Uh, <laughs> motherhood, for instance. Um, but I've seen that many people, despite all that, they still you know, balance this and that and still come up with a story and still be in this, you know, be part of this, even when they, um, they have other things to deal with. So we are survivors, we are working on this, and this is what we are interested in, and this is what we want. So we will be part of it despite the challenges, I think. And I didn't think about, what did you call it, peace and reconciliation? <laughs> I didn't think about that. These are people I saw, and these are things that, you know, like we are dealing with that I saw, and I wanted to write about them, and I wrote about them. So what people see, now, that's their responsibility. What has been the reception of that It's one of my, you know, like, number one read story around the world, of course. I think there's some beauty in it. There's something about it uh, that people can connect with. Um, and I can't really point a finger at it. <laughs> I just wrote a story. I think I, my question was, how would you deal with if your son or your daughter has been abducted and you know that the person is doing terrible things, how would you, you know, um, get them back home? How would you deal with them? I think that's all I was dealing with. Um, and people are reading it and it seems to say something. There's so many people that have told me, oh, you told my story. I'm grateful for, but I, I was just telling one person's story. But in the end, I managed to tell other people's stories as well. So I don't know if some policy is going to change because of it, I have no idea. But we write our stories and hope that somebody picks something out of them.
Do you have anything to say about prizes? And all that stuff? Um, apart from the boxing, you know, the streamlining of stories, um, they encourage. They are good. Yes, please. Because they encourage more people to write. There is um, the fact that there is a prize brings in more people writing because, of course, they are expecting something at the end of the day. So it's a good thing. It's, a, it's both. It's good. Mm. It's good. Apart from the fact that it's stream, when they streamline it, it, it narrows down the the amount of stories and the quality. No, not the quality. Maybe the quantity. Uh, so I'd just like to ask the speakers to do one last thing. Just tell us one word. <coughs> just one word, each of you, and then we're going to wrap up. Just one word. Whatever comes to your mind. Read. <laughs> <laughs> Praise? Praise? Or oh, what? Peace. Peace. Please just give them a hand. <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, I'd like to thank our panelists today. It's wonderful, kind of an intergenerational conversation going on there. I'd like to thank you, the audience, for coming through, sitting through the whole session. The organizers of Rightivism, and of course the beautiful edit, you know, this, this anthology of short stories and pictures on um, wild butterfly dreams. I hope you can go out and buy those books, and of course continue conversations after this. Thank you very much. See you.